Aloha. Welcome to Fast, Healthy, and Ono Cooking's Locally Grown series, where we'll be focusing on locally grown produce that is inexpensive or easily grown. Tonight, we'll be learning how to make seared kalo with mushrooms and thyme and haupia with olena, which is turmeric, and fresh fruit. We'll, we'll also be extending our program by 15 minutes so we so we can include a Q&A with Dr. Amjad Ahmed from the UH College of Tropical Agriculture. My name is Cindy Ling and I'm an AERP Hawaii volunteer. I'll be your host tonight on behalf of our sponsors, Kaunoa Senior Services on Maui, Ua'ala Leaf Cafe at Windward Community College and AERP Hawaii. Welcome. For those of you who are new or may be unfamiliar with AERP Hawaii, we are a membership organization for people 50 and older, but what we do, we do for everyone. We hope that with this series, you can learn some techniques that you can use to build or maintain a healthy lifestyle. Let's do a quick bit of housekeeping. This is a picture of what you should be seeing at the bottom of your Zoom screen on a PC and Mac, and probably the top of the screen on the iPad. Everybody is currently on mute. If you want to submit a question or comment, please click on the button that says Q and A and type in your question. I will be monitoring the questions and making sure they get asked. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you may type your questions in the comments. We won't be using the raise hand command because questions will be committed, will be submitted in the Q and A. The chat command also isn't necessarily going to be needed unless you want to communicate a technical issue. Alice Swift, Dave DeWitt, and Char Charlene are standing by to help. So please make sure you use the Q&A for questions and comments. We recommend that you select speaker side-by-side -side view rather than gallery view for this presentation. Do this by clicking on the upper right of part of your screen where it says view. Once you are in that view, you can change the size of the slides or of the speaker simply by clicking and dragging on the middle bar. Finally, we have added closed captioning to this presentation for those who have difficulty hearing. You can turn this off on your end by clicking on the CC Live Transcript button in the lower right side of your screen and clicking on Hide Subtitle. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Chef Daniel Swift, who will be leading us through this cooking series. Thank you, Cindy. Mahalo plenty. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Okay, awesome. I feel like I'm in like a little bit, I'm in the garden at home. <laughs> we brought these in from home. These are Alice's uh, plants. So uh, welcome everyone um, to the, the third topic in our series where we're looking at some of the local uh, ingredients that have been around Hawaii for a long time, actually around the South Pacific, and we're, we're all used to seeing them in different forms and want to kind of just demystify simple ways to cook them uh, over the course of the last couple classes and then tonight and, and next week as well. So uh, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, I was just reminiscing, of, it's been like a year and a half, I think we've been making classes and that's like 60 plus classes. So uh, thank you everyone for tuning in regularly and sending me emails and, and photos of the items that you cook that are even slightly modified from what we're doing. That's kind of the goal is to get people in the kitchen, get them talking, uh, cooking a little bit healthy, trying new ingredients, trying new approaches. And in that area, I would say we've, we've succeeded. So thanks for that. Uh, so tonight we're looking at two different um, items. One is uh, uh, kalo, uh, what we call kalo or taro uh, locally. There's of course other names for it as well. Uh, that's what this plant is. And then we'll be working with uh, Olena. Uh, and as Cindy said, also known as turmeric, uh, extremely popular um, and incorporating that into a classic hapia dish. So uh, I, I put a couple notes down. Um, there's a really good graphic. I've used this actually for, for class as well. If you just do a simple search on online for uh, uh, Kahlo or, or Taro and it'll and go to the images, there's all kinds of really, really nice images. And this particular one, which probably really hard for you to see, but it, it shows the whole kind of cross section and all of the different stages 
um, of a taro plant, including the root. And it gives the Hawaiian name, which I won't even attempt to pronounce <laughs> beyond Kalo. And um, it talks, and it gives you a little description of kind of what it, what it is. So uh, this is the one that we grow at home. And uh, this is a dry land variety. Dr. Ahmad will probably talk to us about um, the many types of varieties that there are and the ones that they're growing at CTAR and, and the research that they're doing. Um, but it doesn't always have to be um, a submerged in water. Not everybody can uh, create that sort of space at home. So you can just grow it in a pot. Um, I'm not sure the size of this root. This is about a year old, I think, Alice, you've had this one year and a half. Uh, she did harvest one uh, a few weeks ago. It was yeah about the size of a golf ball, maybe. That's being generous. So we just looked at it and marveled at it and kept it instead of eating it because it wouldn't have uh, fulfilled the purpose. But uh, it's fun to grow and they're not that difficult. So if you have a little space, you can get one going. Of course, you can use the leaves as well. This one has a rolled leaf coming up. It's got I left this one on, the, just a leaf that's ready to be cut off, but wanted to show that. There's a little cakey shoot uh, popping up here. Um, and then this is, uh, we try to let it dry out and then we water it, dry out, water it. Um, but it, they're pretty resilient. We live in Kaneohe, so we get quite a bit of rain. Sometimes it stays a little more wet uh, than normal. Um, there, you know, it is rich in fiber. It's rich in nutrients and micronutrients. Um, I put on the sheet here that it's, uh, good for the gut. If you look up the benefits of Kahlo, you'll find there's a lot of things that are listed and, and there's a lot of things that say may help with heart disease, may help with this, may help with that. So uh, weight loss and all sorts of things. So I kind of left those off the list, um, but it does have the, the starch and the fiber depending on what you're looking for at a particular time in your diet. Um, and I'll go through the process that I did to, to trim this one. So this is a uh, uh, a Samoan one, actually. And normally, we this is a little rougher. It has a little bit more, almost like a coconut husk on it. Uh, still trimmed, as would be the other one that we normally use, which is the Hawaiian style. Um, but they're a little bit smoother on the outside, but the skin's not quite as thick. But the flavor is, is pretty much the same. And then here's the one that I've already peeled. And we'll show you this when we get to cutting it um, here shortly. Uh, but great. And the price uh, was a little bit more expensive. I went to uh, the farmer's market yesterday here in Windward. Um, at the mall, uh, they did, none of the stands had it. Uh, they did have uh, ulu, so we've been doing ulu, and it's in season, so you're finding that all over the place. It's at times as well. Most of your supermarkets should have that. Uh, but this was only uh, on this side in times. So I went to Safeway, didn't have it. I went to Foodland, didn't have it. I thought they would carry it. Um, I didn't make it over to Whole Foods, and I didn't have time to make it to town, but you can pick it up in Chinatown. Um, and probably most of your Asian uh, supermarkets would, would carry it as well. Of course, you can get the dehydrated powder at the different places. You can get it in poi form, but if you're looking to cook like we're doing tonight, the whole one, uh, you might have to search around a little bit or use the Samoan variety. Uh, on the Elena, uh, it's in the ginger family, and I've got some here that Noe brought in from our garden. <clears throat> they grow a lot of this here on campus, and my wife grows it here. You can maybe see on the inside, there's a one of the roots is popping up. So it looks exactly like, like this. And it's basically a mini version of ginger, which we're all familiar with. Uh, very deep red or yellow in color. It's kind of earthy. Uh, I, I put down here that it's fragrant and earthy because uh, you do get a lot of fragrance from it. Um, not quite as much as ginger or uh, lemongrass or the uh, but uh, adds a really nice flavor to a lot of dishes. And it's a primary ingredient in all of your yellow curries. So if you like yellow curry, then you're eating turmeric. Uh, there are benefits and health, care, health benefits to this. Maybe Dr. Ahmad could talk about it more. I know that there's research that's been going on even in the area of Alzheimer's. So uh, you see a lot of commercials now for this in the pill form and things like that. So there are uh, benefits um, to eating this in your diet on a regular basis. Uh, but it's great, uh, pretty easy to grow. It does spread, the flowers are great, depending on the type that you're growing. They smell really, really nice. You'll see them on the side of Leaky Leaky if you're driving. Uh, they do really well uh, in the wet environments uh, like Kanyoi and uh, the windward side. So 
Uh, if you have any questions, just chime in, uh, Cindy, that's fine. I'll go ahead and kind of, uh, I'm going to start with uh, the dish that we're going to make tonight with uh, the Palo and get let it cook and simmer. And then I'll move on to the one that we're doing with a twist on uh, classic Calpia. So for peeling this, if, if you buy one whole, and, and they do traditionally, most of the supermarkets that sell it, I know at times they do, they'll, you can get it already trimmed and it'll look like this, maybe it'll cut in wedges and then it's vacuum packed. So you can skip the step of peeling it. it can be a little dirty, uh, messy. Make sure that you wash them first. That's what we did in the back. Uh, and then it's basically like a potato. If you're trimming off the ends and then what we'll do, you could use a peeler, but it's a little thick and a little uneven. I find it's easiest to just use your knife to come down and trim the skin off. And what, I, what I'm doing here is the same as filleting an orange or anything like that. I just sort of follow the line that's created when I do a slice, following the contour, come back here and just keep going along that line that's formed from the skin being removed from the previous cut. And then if there's pits or anything like that, I can come back afterwards and trim those out or spots. These are all actually in pretty good shape. I usually always miss the bottom, so I flip it and do a quick trim on that. And there's a little bit of a spot there and a cavity, so I'm gonna cut that out. So depending on how deep it goes, you just have to Keep moving it. You could come back with a peeler or something rounded, a paring knife and cut it out. Here, I'll just channel this out. And then we can remove that. And then that'll, that will be ready to go. Uh, you can rinse it. We want the starch for the dish that we're doing tonight. This one I did rinse, but because we're going into hot oil, I don't want it to be uh, wet. So I wanna make sure that I dry it off. So I washed the one earlier, put it in a towel in a container and let it sit in the refrigerator for a couple hours. And then I'm just gonna remove the skin. This could go into your compost pile, uh, or vermicompost if you're doing that at home. You don't wanna waste that. And I probably, but the pan's a little bit smaller. So the recipe I wrote was only for one. Uh, so I'm only gonna use the one. And what I, what I had written, if you have that recipe at home, is to cut rings about a half inch or so thick. Uh, this pan, like I said, is a little on the smaller side. So I'm gonna probably cut these in half. It depends on the size of the collo that you get, uh, but almost like a hamburger patty. Uh, so if I, if I cut rings or discs um, about this size, uh, it, it, almost takes the place of a meat or a meat protein in my dinner. So if I'm trying to get that, that texture and that shape and something I can cut with a knife uh, as I eat, this is the cut that I would go for. Uh, because it's a little small, the pan, I'm gonna just cut these in half. I'll probably only do a couple of them so that we have enough room in the pan. This would take a couple batches or I'd use a little bit larger pan. Now you can, uh, refrigerate this, you can freeze these as well. They hold up great. You can cook them first and freeze them after. Uh, either way works fine. Uh, it's really, really stable and almost basically acts like a potato in a sense. If there's uh, anything you do with a potato, you can you can kind of come back and do that with this. Uh, Chef Dan, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, there is a type of taro that needs to be cooked thoroughly or it will cause itchy, itchy throat. How do you identify that type? Are there more than one type that causes itchy throat? Itchy throat, like itchy throat. Uh, well, I cook all of them all the way. We don't eat, eat them raw. Um, so I don't know the specific type. I bet Dr. Ahmad would be able to tell us that. But with any of the ones that we get and that we're cooking, we're always using them and cooking them all the way through. Even if it's grated and used for like a, a kalo pancake or something, we want to make sure that we take it all the way through uh, to fully cooked. Now, this is like a potato, like I said before, and if you've joined us for previous classes, we know that starches and carbohydrates are fully cooked at temperatures over about 195. 
if any of your potatoes or any of your starches hit an internal temperature of 195, they will be completely cooked. It's just science uh, and physics. So as long as you're going to a temperature over that, then you'll be fine. So boiling them um, or baking them in the oven, just making sure that the temperature of the inside gets to that, then you would eliminate that itchy throat if it's from eating raw. But I couldn't tell you the exact uh, type. Uh, I'm not really certain, but let's ask that question later to Dr. Amar. So uh, this is easy. I've got this heating up. I want to sear these and get them like uh, almost caramelized like a steak. So what I want to do is go through the ingredients that I have here with it, but um, let my pan heat up as well. So that's very simple. What I put on the recipe for this evening is uh, just some onions, uh, some mushrooms. I picked these up at the market uh, at Windward yesterday. These are shiitakes. It was a one pound bag. It was like $5, uh, which was $3 more than the button mushroom. So if you're on a budget, you probably want to go for the button mushroom. Um, but I haven't had these in a while. And because they're a little more earthy, all mushrooms are pretty earthy. Um, I thought I'd splurge tonight and, um, and get something a little bit different. So it, it can be canned mushrooms. You can get dried shiitakes, rehydrate them. And then you can be flexible with this recipe as well and create your own sort of version of the ingredients that go with it. This is just, you know, this could easily have garlic. I've got the onions, I've got the mushrooms, I got a little bit of thyme in the cooler and the stuff that we have from uh, the last couple classes. I still got lemongrass, I've got some Hawaiian chilies, I found some peppers. I had orange, yellow, and green, so I'm going to throw those in, maybe one chili pepper to add a little bit of heat. So get creative. Uh, the recipes that we're giving you are sort of templates, and then we want you to be able to get creative and utilize the things that you're familiar with and the things that you have in your fridge. So this is nice and hot now. I'm going to uh, season my first, my, my kalo, a little salt and pepper. I always do both sides. And okay, as you're salting, I have a question. Go right ahead. Um, uh, from Natalie, she wants to know, is there a weight range to the color root? A weight range? As opposed to the size, like two pounds, three pounds. Oh, on the recipe. Yeah, yeah. well, the ones that I had here that looked about the size of, let's see, what would people know? Um, those were a little little bit over two pounds. So I, I was, I don't know, any sport. I'm always thinking sports ball, a little bit bigger than a softball. Uh, if anyone throws a styrofoam nerf, it's kind of the nerf. <laughs> Nerf size, um, but weight wise, those were two and a half pounds ish. And um, yeah, this is, so here's a jar of, of honey that's 30 ounces. So it was about that size. And then once you trim it, you're losing uh, a little bit of the weight, obviously. So you probably end up with about a pound and three quarters, a little bit more depending on how well you're trimming it. So that's a great question. But what, you know, even if they only have a larger one, you can just get that and then do the recipe and then set uh, aside the excess that you have or the extra and use it for uh, another meal another time. And like this, I could even just do this kalo by itself. Uh, so I'm cooking it here with a little bit of that uh, avocado oil and the oil choice is up to you. It could be olive, it could be uh, corn oil, like whatever your favorite cooking oil at home is. Uh, but what you do is you want enough in the bottom to give it a little bit of a sear, trying to get that color and that caramelization that I'll, I should be able to show you here in a second. Yeah, it's already starting to brown. And it's very similar to, you know, kalo chips. It's very popular. A lot of people serve taro chips or kalo chips where they're just sliced really thin and fried. Um, we're back. Sorry, that's my fault. Oops. I... I forgot to plug in my laptop. Although I had a full charge, I'm not sure why that went down so quick. But uh, So what I did here, if you can see now, is uh, just added the vegetables. So I got the nice color on the kalo and it turned a nice golden brown. I flipped it and then I added my mushrooms, onions, peppers, thyme, and the um, other ingredients, the chili pepper that I decided to throw in there. And then I'm going to let that cook. I'm going to throw a little bit of a lid on that. I have some more questions. Go ahead. I'm hitting this with just a little bit of our seasoning. That's the Hawaiian seasoning with Hawaiian salt. I'll let that go. Well, that was a pretty quick recovery. Thank you, Alice. 
That's the brains of the operation. That's not me. Trust me. It's Cindy and Char and everybody else. I'm just here to like make dinner. <laughs> okay, so from this is from Gigi. A Kalamai posted in chat. Aloha from Chicago. I miss wetland Kalo Lehua. Here I can only find dry land, Chinese, and large Samoan taro. Can I use those? And she also wants to know will the instant pot work? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, to both of those questions, you can use uh, those. A um, little bit different flavor like we were talking about earlier, but you're, again, you want to get that internal temperature to 195 so that it's cooked all the way through. And uh, you can use an instant pot for that. I would expedite it much quicker. If you're using mushrooms and peppers and things like we have here, uh, you don't want to be careful just not to make that too mushy. Uh, so an instant pot would probably do it in about, I don't know, like five minutes. It's hard to say because they take time to come up to pressure and then they start to cook and the timing starts at that point. So uh, absolutely though, just play around with it for sure. And then the ingredients that I have here for the, uh, for the halpia, it's basically the standard. And I, I just picked up some Elena uh, powder, turmeric powder. Uh, I find this all the time at, um, at Ross or Marshall's. They have it in the little food section and it's really reasonably priced. This is organic turmeric powder. Uh, you can, of course, grate fresh if you're growing it at home, which we have a combination of the two uh, here tonight. But if you don't want to grow it and you don't have the time, then you can definitely pick it up uh, uh, in the store. And then I've got the turmeric uh, fresh and uh, ground. I've got a little bit of uh, sugar substitute and the cornstarch, which I'm going to mix with some water. And the coconut milk I have heating up. And you can get the low fat coconut milk or you can just take um, coconut milk and dilute it with uh, water. Use it equal parts coconut milk and water because there is a lot of fat in the coconut milk. And if you're watching that intake and trying to make things a little bit on the healthier side like we are, then you want to try to reduce that. So equal parts water and coconut milk would work fine or the low fat coconut milk. And then your favorite sugar substitute. And that can go in. I'm just bringing this to a boil and then I'll add my turmeric. And as I mentioned earlier, with what we have going on over here, as you can see, the aromas are starting to come out of the thyme, the pepper, the kalo, the onions, the mushrooms. Uh, it will absorb that little bit of oil that we had. And what I'm gonna do now is hit this with just a touch of water to kind of steam it. So this is almost like a braise like we've done a number of times over the course of the class or the series. And then I put that lid on it. So that will trap the moisture in there. It will help cook that kalo all the way through because those are a little thicker slices and it'll be right where we want it. And then like I was saying earlier, all starches cook at 195. That means that this uh, cornstarch slurry needs to come to a boil as well. And we always say a boil because boiling is 212. And generally speaking, I mean, it may vary a little bit with the sugar content and things like that. But uh, for the most part, it's right around 212. So if I pour this slurry into my uh, boiling mixture, I know that it's going to be hot enough. And when I bring it back up to a boil, it's going to be done. Simple as that. So I can see this boiling. Actually, let me move it over a little bit. So hopefully you can get a nice view of it. And you can see the beautiful color from that Elena in there. And it's coming up to a boil. And then I'm going to add my slurry. I like it to be at a nice rapid boil when I add my slurry, because then it, it cooks that really, really quickly. And it's done almost instantly. So this is basically a stirred custard. And they do make the mixes. You can find them in the store, uh, the mixes for hapia. They're a little expensive, actually. I checked them. They were sold out, but uh, it was like $9 for a packet to make uh, hapia, which would be easy uh, to make, but this is not a complicated recipe either. So, uh, and it'll save you a, a lot of money. So I, I got uh, one chilled, but this one is done. Once it comes to a boil, then you know it's done. We're just cooking it so that the starch co is completely cooked. And as I said, if it's boiling, it's 212. That means the starch is done and it's gonna get as thick as it's gonna get.
not only is this beautiful, but it's delicious. Uh, I really love this. We, we tend to make this here in layers. So we'll stu still do a layer of white, but then we follow it up with a layer of the yellow Olena papilla on top. Tonight, we're just going straight um, full Olena. So it'll be the yellow all the way through. And then you transfer it into a container. It could be individual containers, or you can just use one large one like I'm doing here. And you need to chill it. And that makes it really, really simple. So th this is a nice uh, plastic container that we had. I only have one um, eight inch square right, um, pan, pan. So I have one done already that's already chilled and it should be ready to turn out. Now, if you're gonna serve it in the vessel here, then you don't have to line it with plastic wrap. If you're planning on turning it out, it's just easier if you just throw a little bit of plastic wrap across the bottom before you pour in the hapia. And so I just loosen that a little bit. If I'm turning it out, I'll usually lay the plate on top. Turn it over. And you should have no trouble with it turning out if you have that liner there. If you didn't, you'd be maybe trying to shake it. It might tear and fall apart. And we don't want that. And then we simply peel off the plastic and you have the nice cheetah uh, hapia that you could then come back and do your, your garnishing with. So tonight I have put uh, fresh fruit to go with it. Um, there's so many different ones to choose from. We went outside and, and harvested some tea leaves. So first I wanna throw down a couple tea leaves on here to give it some as color. You, as you're decorating, um, I have a couple questions. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, Natalie wants to know about the color. Can she freeze it, um, freeze the extra and is um, raw or not? Yeah, absolutely. A raw or cooked, any state really. It's almost like a baked good, like bread, where you can freeze it in uh, any state, whether it's cooked raw or whatever. Totally up to you. Okay, and Janice wants to know, um, can you use coconut oil? For the cookie? I guess for the pan. Yeah, absolutely. Use your favorite oil. Just remember the smoke points are always a little bit different. So if you're using uh, coconut oil, it might uh, smoke a little bit quicker than some of the other oils. So you just don't want it to burn. Just watch your heat temperature and you'll be fine. Okay, I have from Peggy and Jody. Um, they are saying, I've done that at my meetings, no problem. And nice and colorful about everything going off. So. Oh. Not Perfect. not to worry. Not to worry. Yeah, we'll do yeah. that every every sixty episodes. Well, <laughs> we've been, I don't want to. I'm gonna knock on wood. I'm not gonna say anything because we've been super fortunate. Uh, so I just put some strawberries here. I put some uh, dragon fruit um, that was given to us by Carolyn, who grows it in her garden. I've got a couple bananas from the garden. These little small uh, uh, apple bananas. I'm gonna slice a couple of those. And sprinkle them on or you could do this in an individual dish and just serve it straight up by itself it's totally up to you uh the one thing i do want to mention before we plate up this last one i'm about on time here um is that the the trick i find and i always teach folks when they're making custard stirred custards um your your primary variable once you know what your flavor profile is and and how sweet you want it and what type of sweetener you're using uh, the big variable is how much starch to use. So I gave a rough guideline in the um, recipe that I sent out. I also um, would say that take into account where you're serving it. In here right now, the air conditioning's on. We keep it at about 72 degrees. That's completely different than if we were doing a, um, a barbecue outside in the summer where the temperature might be 90 degrees and if, if I'm doing that and I'm cutting squares and serving them that way, then I would need to add a little more starch so that it's more solid. So sometimes you may notice if you get a hot pia in a, in a vessel, it's really soft like a pudding or if you get it in a square at a luau, when we used to go to luau's, um, you can pick it up with your fingers and it's like, a, like an ice cream bar almost and you can just eat it. And that's just the variation in the amount of cornstarch that's used. So keep that in mind that it's a variable. And you can see I cut a little square here 
I can take it off, set it to the side. I made this for indoor. So I wouldn't, it's been out for about half an hour, but I wouldn't be able to pick this up and eat it with my hands because it's, it's a little too soft. I mean, it, I could, but it's drooping and it would fall apart. Um, so if I were doing an outdoor thing and I wanted people to pick it up with their hands, then I would definitely increase the quantity of the cornstarch uh, that I put in there. So if you're doing it in individual cups, it doesn't matter. People will eat it with a spoon. So one of the I tips. Have a, yeah. I have a question about um, the cornstarch. This is from Paula. She's allergic to cornstarch. So what other kind of thickening would you use? Yeah, absolutely. Any, any starch would work. You could use arrowroot. You could use a potato starch. You could use rice flour. You just get a little temp, uh, different texture from each one of them. Um, there's all kinds of gums and different starches that they use in, in processing. So if you're allergic to cornstarch, you're probably reading the labels more. But um, uh, any starch that's ground or any dried carbohydrate that's drowned, ground into a flour would work. T tapioca. Now they all have a different... Uh, amount of thickening agent or thickening power to them. So usually you can find a conversion sheet that will take a comparison between cord starch and whatever the other starch is that you're using. Okay, here we go. So this one's ready and I'm almost done. I'm sorry, Dr. Ahmad, I'm taking a little bit of your time or actually maybe I'm a little early and that'll give you a chance. I think we're going up to a six tonight or something like that. Now you can see that these, these maintain their shape and this is what I love about making it in this style is that you end up with, like I said before, something that's almost like a, almost like a little steak or a piece of chicken. It's got great texture to it. And you could serve it in a whole piece. And then the person that's eating will cut it with a, with a fork. And you can see the bottom's nice and golden brown. So it's, it is, like I said, almost like a, a seared piece of, meat of sorts and the flavor is really really nice so this is uh good i'm gonna hit it with just a little more water because i want a little bit of a glaze to this if i hit that with a teeny bit of water another another pinch of salt and then just taste the sauce really quickly that's the deglazing factor that's really important that you if you're browning things that you always want to make sure that you deglaze you add a little moisture at the end or don't let it reduce as much as I did. And yeah, and then you'll end up with a really nice, nice sauce. So that's got a little bit of heat from that chili and it's got the flavor from the peppers as well. So that those were just additions from the recipe that I threw in. And so you're, so um, Natalie is asking, did you, um, add in orange bell pepper. So what, what were your additions to the recipe? Yeah, tonight I added uh, orange, green, and yellow bell pepper that I took from Chef Steve's uh, set up in the kitchen. <laughs> Today I went in the cooler and there they were. So I just cut a little piece off of each one. Uh, he'll find out tomorrow when he comes in uh, that he's missing that. And then I added uh, one uh, pepper and I showed you uh, lemongrass, but I didn't put any in. Um, but I was trimming it up because I'm going to utilize it for something else. But this would have been great in there as well. Just throw in uh, one piece of lemongrass in the beginning. You know, again, garlic would have been great. Whatever vegetable you have available at home would work perfectly. So uh, anything like that would give it a, that little bit of extra. But, you know, you can't go wrong with the onions for sure, um, with that little bit of avocado oil and then the kalo. And then you can see that this should be nice and uh, tender. You cut through it real easily. And the reason I like, uh, don't mind the fingers, sorry. The reason I like uh, the sauce is because it creates almost like a little gravy for us. So when we come back to eat um, the kalo, you have that little bit of gravy that's on the bottom. You can see, I think you can hopefully see that there, that moisture. And then you spoon that over the top because, uh, you know, a potato or anything that's starchy like this, on the inside, when it, when it's thick, can be a slightly dry. So a little bit of that, you know, brushed over the top as you eat it would be great. And if you had leftovers of this, this could be cubed up and turned into like hash for breakfast with a sausage or something like that. Uh, really, really versatile. So I have some more questions about the halpia. 
Yeah, Both of course. Pat and Judy are asking about when you do a double layer halpia, yes. do you have to, um, do you put both layers on or do you have to refrigerate the first layer? Yes, you're correct on the second one. You always want to do the first layer. And so I would do probably a, just a double batch, uh, do the first layer of Hapia white and then chill it, let it set up and then pull it out and make the second batch and pour it over the top. So in the kitchen, we actually do a shortbread crust on the bottom, but uh, if you're doing the straight up Hapia, you don't eliminate that. Um, but you do want to set it up first before you add the second layer on top. Otherwise, it'll just sink through. But uh, that might be cool too if you just swirled it. You know, if you made them at the same time and poured one and then the other and then did a little swirl with the toothpick, you get a really pretty pattern. And that would be nice as well. But if you want a clean layer like jello, you have to set it first. Okay. So um, I have a question from Baggage Abru Can you freeze fresh turmeric? Yeah, of course. Yep, absolutely. Now you'll lose some of the moisture that's in it um, if it's fresh. Uh, as, it, as it thaws out, you might bleed out a little bit and it be, might be a little bit softer, but you can definitely freeze it, no problem. Um, a question about the um, the plastic, the white, the plastic that you put in the, the pan to line it, oh, uh -huh. will it react oh. with a hot liquid? No. No, all of the, we're only at 212 here at most, maybe slightly over with the sugar and whatnot. Um, but most of the plastic wraps that you use at home and the ones that are used in restaurants, they're actually good uh, up to like 350 degrees. So it's very common for us to, to take something that we're roasting in the oven at 350, cover it with plastic wrap and then cover it with foil and it holds up well. So at 212, you have no problem at all. If you're using a plastic container like like the one I did here for the demo, I wouldn't need it. This will pop right out. So if you have a plastic Tupperware, then you wouldn't need to necessarily uh, line it with plastic wrap. A uh, question about, um, this is from Jody. Uh -huh. What kind of texture should the chilled Olena be? The chilled Olena, you mean the Hapia? No, she's, she just said the chilled Olena. The chilled Olena. Um, yeah, Wait, I, yeah, I'm guessing, uh, that it, we're talking about the, the hapia and that would be, it's a smooth texture, uh, but firm. So it's almost like jello, uh, when it's cold and set up, but if, uh, I mean, if it, there's a different question there, just go ahead and type it in and we'll, we'll answer that. Okay. Um, Janice has, if you do a shortbread crust, does it go on the bottom or on the top? So when you turn it over, is it on the top or the bottom? A great question, Janice. Uh, if you're doing an Olena, well, uh, or excuse me, if you're doing a shortbread crust and then the Hapia and Olena Hapia, uh, it's usually just cut. It's done in the pan and it's not turned out. Uh, because if you because Hapia is so soft, if you were to flip it upside down like a crunch cake, pumpkin crunch or something, when you cut through the shortbread, it will crush the Hapia. So when we do that, we just serve it like a bar. So it's almost like a pie. When we slice it, you get the crust and then the two layers of hapia. So just do it in your pan, bake your crust first, press in your shortbread, bake it, cool it, one layer of hapia, cool it, another layer of hapia, cool it, and then cut it and serve it like, like a piece of pie. So great question. We have a, another question from Holly. Um, uh -huh. This is regarding the kalo um, and the Instant Pot. Yep. So she's asking, would you saute the kalo, all of that first, and then would you start pressure cooking it? And then if you do that, when do you add the veg veggies or um, the mushrooms and the coconut milk? Yeah, that's a great question because that's the trick with the Instant Pot or any pressure cooker. Um, I personally, we use them here not a lot most uh, actually only for the show for the most part but um i would saute it um on the saute setting and brown it just exactly like we did here then add the vegetables i would probably omit the pressure cooking part because as you saw that only took us like 15 minutes and if you cut it a little bit smaller obviously we have big steaks here but if you cut it smaller you can cook 
the entire dish in a solid 15 minutes easily. So um, by the time you add the vegetables and then bring up the uh, pot to a pressure, uh, you can tend to overcook the different items and it might take you two or three or four tries to get it right. So um, I would omit that, but you could use the lid and put the lid on, keep it on saute and it would trap that steam in there enough to where it would cook it like we did tonight. And then you can control it so you can remove the lid and check it at any point as opposed to kind of set it, forget it and hope for the best. So that's the challenge with the pressure cooker is to get everything cooked to perfection at the same time when you have different different textures and different cooking times for each item. So uh, just leave it on that saute setting and put the lid on and then work it back and forth by checking it um, and follow the pr process that we did tonight. And that should work fine. And keep in mind any of the vegetables that you add, uh, a mushroom you can cook forever, nothing's gonna happen. Peppers will hold up, they have quite a bit of fiber, they'll stay together. Onions for the most part will stay together. Carrots and things like that that are firm, vegetables will stay together. You know, but there are certain things like asparagus or items that you could put in there that would turn to mush, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, things like that. So be selective with what you're adding and then just make sure that you're using the right cooking time when you do add it. So once it's in, it's hot, you add the water for steam, cover it, you know, a, a piece of asparagus will only probably take two minutes. So that would be something you would add at the very end. So uh, that's the, yeah, that's the beauty of cooking is learning all of those little tricks. That's um, a really good question. Thank you. Um, uh, I have just one more question and I need to tell everybody that Dr. Ahmad is not coming in tonight. So after the last question is done, we'll be pow for tonight. Okay. So, um, so do you do, um, Carol was asking about white wine. Mm -hmm. And um, in the Kahlo recipe, somebody was asking, did you use ground thyme or fresh thyme? Uh, two questions for you. Question, Carol. And if we, if you wanna ask, if there are other questions, I'm happy to stick around till six. Um, I used fresh. I used this right out of the garden. Uh, and actually tonight I used lemon thyme. You can see it's still together in a bunch uh, after that cooking. A few of the leaves may have fallen off. Um, <clears throat> so that is the one that I use, but you could use either one. Uh, it's no problem. Totally up to you. Um, so, you know, any other herb would work as well. You could use Italian parsley or a regular parsley. This is an earthy type of dish. So I like to use those what I call woody. If you remember back to the classes we did around herbs, I always classify them in two kind of primary categories. You're sort of leafy lettuce-like ones, parsley, uh, cilantro, dill, and then you've got the woody ones that are rosemary, uh, sage, uh, thyme, things like that that are hearty. And both would be fine, but tonight I just chose to use something on the woody side. And then was there another part to that question? I apologize. Um, Kara wanted to know about white wine. Absolutely. As opposed to adding water, you, you could do that for sure. Um, serving it with white wine would be good as well. Um, <laughs> but uh, any, any of the things that we do uh, system-wise or in terms of the approach to cooking, uh, I really like it that Carol and a lot of you guys are, are thinking about substitution. So when, when we're adding that liquid, that could easily be the white wine. It could be water. It could be stock. If we were using a chicken, a low-fat chicken broth or a low-fat beef broth or, you know, a, a leftover half can of diced tomatoes that you pureed would be great with a little bit of water. So, you know, there's so many different approaches to the flavor profile that you end up with. The trick is really like, what do you have? Uh, how thick is it? Is it going to create the steam? Is it going to uh, bring the effect that I need uh, for the technique that I'm executing? But flavor-wise, totally up to you. So wine or anything like that. A little bit of, I mean, even this earthy thing with a nice uh, whiskey uh, would be good. A, a couple tablespoons of scotch whiskey uh, in there would give it oh that really nice kind of woody, earthy, bourbon barrel type flavor with the thyme that would go together great with the mushrooms and everything. So yeah, be creative. That's great. Great questions, Carol. Um, Sandra wants to know, um, she wants to use a nine by 13 pan for the halpia. Can she double the recipe? 
Yeah, and I have the recipe here. I was looking at um, the one that I have, and it's got a can of coconut milk, a 13 ounce can, <clears throat> a third of a cup of cornstarch, a quarter cup of water to, to make the cornstarch slurry. What I would probably recommend for this recipe, if you have that and you're making it at home, is to add a can of water. So if you're doing the can of coconut milk, then come back and do a can of water as well. So you just take out a little bit of water to dissolve the cornstarch, but the rest goes into it. So this makes, this is a actually a, a nine by nine and it's pretty thin. So I would say, depending on the thickness you're looking for, double would be fine. Uh, so if you went with uh, two cans and then you doubled um, the water, that would work perfectly. So to get a nice, you know, a lot of people like the nice thick inch inch and a half thick alpia. This one is about three quarters of an inch. So if you're using a larger pan, it'd be even thinner. So you're probably best to double it for sure. And then remember that extra, extra bit of water. I have some um, more of the two layer alpia questions. Mm -hmm. um, Holly wants to know, do you really need to um, chill the bottom in the first or can you just pour carefully the orange layer on the top and just chill it once? Uh, if you want to, perf I mean, if you're in a restaurant and you're selling it for $12, or probably more these days, restaurants are getting expensive. Uh, God bless our restaurants, though. It's so hard to make it in this business today. Um, if you want that perfect layer, you probably want to get it in there. You may even have noticed that when I poured this one uh, out, it's got a slight dome to it. It thickens really, really quickly. And as soon as you take it off the heat and you put it in, uh, it's, it's a little difficult to get that perfectly flat um, surface on top. But even at room temperature, if you give it five minutes, then you'll be okay. But what you, the key is really to make sure you're doing two different pots. Don't try to make it a big batch of white, pour some out and then add Olena. That would be challenging because it's already gonna be thick and it won't have boiled and it won't have brought the flavor out of the Olena. Um, or the uh, turmeric powder. Um, so you can do it that way. And, you know, it's not like you're selling it and someone's going to complain that it's not a perfectly flat layer. Uh, experiment with it. Uh, I think you could avoid it. And it wouldn't take long for it to set up. Like I said, this one, this one already I could pour and it hasn't even been in the fridge. So I could come back now with a layer of white. It would work fine. So I like that you're thinking about timing and how to make things quicker. That's what we have to do as well. And it's really good. You may have noticed I've taken like five bites of this, this piece already. Uh, not only does it colorful and pretty and looks great against the strawberries and the uh, dragon fruit, but I, I just love that, that subtle flavor of the Olena in it. It's really nice. So I have some Olena questions now. Yep. Um, the first one is from Janice. When you grow it, when do you know when the root is ready to harvest and use? Well, um, Alice could probably answer that in more detail if it needs to be, but uh, like the ones that um, Noe brought up today, uh, you, you can see them like growing out. These go crazy. We recommend you grow it in a pot because if you're growing it in a bed, it'll just continue to spread and spread and spread. And you'll see them start to poke up out of the uh, out of the dirt, so you should be able to pull it up at any time. Once you get it going and you get it established, it's really more a matter of how do you how do you keep it back, <laughs> and how do you utilize it um, depending on how much you're growing. But I would recommend you stick with a pot, and you'll be able to see uh, the roots coming up out of the pot. Then you know that you can remove one of those flowers. Here, I would just take the um, I think they call this a mother. If I'm not mistaken, there's a term for the round bulb that you would save and you can replant, but you take off these little fingers and those are the ones that you utilize. And then you could put this back in dirt in a separate pot and it'll continue to grow. So sort of like a potato. Um, now Gigi wants to know, uh, does anybody know if Hawaiian olena is different from the turmeric I find in the Asian Indian grocery or regular supermarkets here. Now she's out on the continent. Well, I can tell you that um, Noe and the folks in uh, Hawaiian studies, Kumututi and Mahana, 
they say yes. Uh, and they only grow and work with, they make a lot of different products with what they grow down there. Uh, and they only work with uh, organic uh, and the variety they call Hawaiian. So there's a lot of different varieties out there, just like Kahlo. So if you look it up online, you can find, and they have different flowers too. So not only, like I said earlier, are you getting something that you can use from under the soil, you get beautiful and uh, fragrant flowers. So there is a difference. Um, in the tasting side of things, I would say it would be difficult to notice a difference in flavor. Uh, Color-wise, same thing. Um, but yeah, there's different, definitely different varieties and there are people that feel very strongly about the type that they use. So um, even with this, even though it's organic, I showed it to Noe and she kind of frowned. <laughs> she frowned at me. <laughs> She's like, what, what are you doing? Uh, they, they grow their own, they grind it, they dry it, they do, do it A to Z, uh, which is a lot of work. I don't have time to, to grow and process that much. It increases the cost, but yeah, there's a, there's a whole, you know, method and uh, psychology and marketing and, and cultural uh, component to all of the products that we work with here. So yeah, just do a little research, ask around. It's kind of fun. Okay, quick, quick things because we're running out of time. Okay. Um, Holly wants to know, if, could you please show her that route again? Yeah, um, it was a little bit off her screen when, when you're holding it. And then Judy said for her, after the flower dies, it's time for her to harvest the turmeric. And um, somebody wants to know, can you taste the difference between ginger and turmeric? Uh, definitely you can taste the difference between ginger and turmeric, totally different. Uh, we're all familiar with the flavor of ginger. Uh, turmeric's a lot more mild and a lot more earthy. Uh, it's definitely also, as you can tell, used in dye or coloring fabrics. As a matter of fact, I got it on my shirt today. And be real, don't wear something nice uh, in the kitchen when you're working with it, because once it gets on your clothes, you will not get it out. Um, I've never been able to get it out. So don't wear white t-shirts or white clothes and then work with the turmeric powder. I just wiped my hand on my uh, apron and hit my shirt and made a stain earlier. Uh, and then I trimmed up the only whole one that I had. So I have the, you know. So she wants the turmeric. Oh, the turmeric. Oh, okay. yeah, absolutely. So here's a couple different ones here. I don't know if that shows up clearly um, on Can the camera. Can you point to the, point to the mother? Yep, that's the round one, the round one, as opposed to the fingers. And Alice, do you have something? Question, but uh, I was told that for propagating, you can just break them into like the fingerlings, and then uh, you literally can just slop them into soil, and it will seem like it's not doing anything. But then all of a sudden, you'll see little green things popping up. Shoots coming up. So yeah, Alice said that she read that you can put any part of it in, and it will grow. Uh, Noe propagates it all the time, so she, you know, she is uh, deep into the culture of Olena. And there, there's a term for this little round, I think it was, she said mother. And all of these little shoots are gonna then become fingers. So you'll probably get fingers to grow as well. Sort of like a tea leaf. If you cut the stalk of a tea leaf and just throw it on the ground, next thing you know, they're sprouting out of the sides of it. So um, yeah, and you can find this at times in packages. Uh, you can find it in Chinatown um, from different parts of, um, the islands and chipped in probably from the mainland as well. Okay, um, um, Paula wants to know if if you use fresh olena in the, I guess it's in the haupia, um, yep. do you have to strain it? Uh, no, I wouldn't strain it. I would just use a grater. Um, I had like the, the little ginger grater. These are very common. You find them in the specialty Japanese stores or they may even carry them now in like Safeway and things like that in the, in the section where there's kitchen tools, but it's like a really fine grater. So uh, I don't, I'm hesitant to do one now because I'll, I'll get it all over the place. Um, but you, it just gets a really fine like paste from it, basically. Uh, if you're worried about that or you don't want to get one of these, you could also cut it into thin strips and then put it in and let it boil and then take it out before you thicken it. So you get the flavor in there. It might not be quite as yellow as the powder, 
or the paste, but uh, you'd get some of the flavor for sure. So those are two different ways that you could do it. Uh, if you don't want to use the powder, you're going to use the fresh. Um, uh, we only have a couple more minutes. So okay. mahalo to, to everybody who has come and whoever, whoever is watching from home, if you guys want to go and leave now, that's fine. I'm just going to ask him one more question about how long do you cook kalo? Thank you. If you have to go, we understand. Uh, mahalo for joining us. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, this is really good. And we hope to see you next week. Wait, wait, you got to answer. How long do you, does, does it take to cook the kalo? Oh, I thought you had another question and folks were tuning out. Um, yeah. yeah, it depends on the thickness. Again, temperature is the key anytime you're cooking carbs. Um, so it, because of the thickness that we have here, the time was about 15 minutes with some steam after browning. Um, you could even take that entire head of kalo and wrap it in foil. Cindy, you probably cook it that way sometimes. Um, they do it when there's luau's and whatnot. That would take a little bit longer. So it all depends on the thickness. What you need is to make sure that the temperature and the center gets to 195 or higher. So if you're, uh, if you don't have one of the little simple kitchen thermometers, you can pick them up. They're not very expensive uh, anymore. And that was what you would utilize to test it. You could test something as thin as this, or you could test something larger. But the key is always getting the internal temperature right. So it's hard to always say, oh, you need this amount of time at this temperature. It depends on the thickness. So I know that that's kind of a tough one, but it's not unlike a potato where I don't have a fork here, but I do have a skewer. If I were cooking this in the pan and I wanted to know if it was done, I can just take a skewer. And if it goes in with little resistance, like a potato, you're boiling potatoes for a potato salad, same exact thing. So if, it, if it's resistant and you can't get the skewer to go in and come out easily, then it's still not cooked all the way through. Mahalo. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all our questions because we are running out of time. And um, so mahalo to Chef Dan and mahalo to everybody who stayed with us for this, <laughs> this extra time. And we'll hope everybody will join us for next week. October 14th, which is lemongrass. Lemongrass. Yeah, lemongrass. So I'm again, coming. thank you. And Ikalamai for the, <laughs> the video cutting out. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Mahalo. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.